Good afternoon. My name is Alexandra McGarris, and this is Venable's Consumer Financial Services 2017 Outlook Post-Inauguration Day Insights. Uh, before we get started with our program today, a quick note about CLE. CLE will be offered for today's webinar, so please stay tuned until the very end for that code. Information about the CLE certificate will automatically be sent to attendees after the session. Also, our webinar today will be recorded and downloadable, um, and the slides will be available along with a YouTube, present, a YouTube video of the presentation later this week. Um, with respect to submitting questions, please follow the on-screen prompts. We will do our best to incorporate them into our discussion and, and remind you periodically of the opportunity to ask questions. Of course, contacting us and asking questions does not create an attorney-client relationship, and the opinions expressed today are those of the individual attorneys, so please, please do not send us confidential information. Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague and the moderator of today's session, Jonathan Pompan. Thank you very much, Alex. Now, three days removed from the inauguration and three weeks from the start of the new Congress, the regulatory implications of the 2016 presidential and congressional elections for consumer financial services is our challenge today to put into context. What's next is what everybody's asking. And on top of that, there's pending and has been expected rulemakings on debt collection, arbitration, and small dollar loans at the CFPB. And there's ongoing investigations, litigation, and supervisory exams and other activities by government agencies like the CFPB and FTC. In some cases, there's been regulation by enforcement. And in many cases, there's also ongoing work happening on the state level as well as by the Federal Trade Commission. So good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Pompan here at Venable. And I'd like to welcome you to Venable's Consumer Financial Services Outlook 2017, where our panel will provide detailed specifics and different perspectives on the outlook ahead about lending and other topics. Each is going to provide their voice to the discussion. I'm honored to be sitting across from my colleagues that are in the trenches every day working with companies in the consumer financial services space. Joining us and formally from the CFPB's Office of Regulations, we've got Andy Arculin. Andy, welcome. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, to introduce another panelist, we've, we also have Allison Baker, also a CFPB alum. Um, Allison is from the CFPB's Enforcement Office and also was a, a DOJ trial attorney. She does uh, much of our consumer financial services litigation and civil enforcement work here at Venable. Allison? Thank you, Andy. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Allison Baker, and it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Andrew Bigart. Andrew is one of our attorneys who manages our payments practice here at Venable. Um, Andrew spends a lot of his time thinking about and working on payments-related matters for all of our clients, and in particular thinks a lot about how payments uh, work touches the consumer finance laws as those laws are emerging. Great. Thank, thanks, Allison, for that. Uh, my name is Andrew Bigger, and I'm here to introduce uh, Alex McGarris, a counsel in our New York office. Uh, Alex works with uh, all manner of, of different consumer financial services companies uh, with a particular uh, specialization and focus in debt collection um, and uh, works with a lot of companies on examinations and investigations as well, which she'll be touching on later in the presentation today. Thank you, Andrew. And I have the pleasure of introducing Meredith Boylan, who is a, one of our stellar litigators in our DC office. She has currently um, several uh, active investigations and invest in litigation before the CFPB um, and other um, state and federal regulators. Um, in Meredith's prior life, she uh, was an assistant district attorney in the Manhattan DA's office, so also has great insights to share with us on kind of how uh, regulators uh, set their enforcement priorities and work through their investigations. Thanks very much, Alex. And I am here to introduce Kara Ward. Kara is a member of Venable's Legislative and Government Affairs Group with a focus on financial services. Prior to entering private practice, Kara was an attorney in the General Counsel's Office at the Treasury Department, and she served there during the financial crisis. Thanks so much, Meredith. Having been at Treasury, there's a lot going on now that will impact 
against all aspects of Treasury, the CFPB, financial services, and the macro economy. But with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Jonathan. Thanks, and thanks, everyone. You know, broadly, the President campaigned on reducing regulations, and this emphasis continues through uh, his latest announcements that have been uh, you know, going on now for the last four days, um, and even since then. And in the coming months and years, uh, as policymakers are going to be looking at consumer financial services, uh, it certainly portends that they're going to be reconsidering past legislation or possibly amendments uh, to the scope of certain existing regulations. All this, of course, is within the backdrop of the existing regulatory landscape that exists today for companies in the consumer financial services space. This landscape, for the most part, has been in place for the last five years and even stretching back, in some cases, with some statutes, over 30 or more years. That's all now in the hands of the discretion of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, as well as the Federal Trade Commission, and with states remaining active, too. And of course, there's also the private litigation risk. So today what we're going to focus on is the new Congress and President, the prospects for reform, the lookout for CFPB challenges. There's no question that right now the CFPB is facing a number of systemic and existential challenges, both politically as well as legally. We're going to also talk about the regulatory outlook, both from the perspective of what we see today being the case, as well as what possibly could be the perspective going forward in any new reform to CFPB or otherwise. We're also going to talk about the impact in the next year and the outlook for innovation and investments. There's been no question that FinTech and other topics have been really front and center for companies that are looking to build out their programs or develop programs in the consumer financial services space. It's a very important area. And then supervision and examinations. Some of the largest banks and some of the largest non-banks have been under supervisory exams on an ongoing or routine basis uh, since the CFPB started that program a number of years ago. It has broad implications for what's happening on the ground at companies and compliance management systems, and we'll take a look at that not only from today's perspective, but also what we see coming in the future. And of course, the specter of enforcement has been front and center. The CFPB itself calls itself an enforcement agency. And we'll take a look at what that means today as well as what that might mean going forward, not just from the CFPB perspective, but also looking at it from the Federal Trade Commission and the state's attorneys general and regulators that have independent enforcement authority for their various statutes on the state level. Now, as Alex mentioned earlier, we'll take questions as, we, as they come from the audience. Please use the on-screen prompts and we'll attempt to work those into the conversation. We'll also have at the end an opportunity for a Q&A period as well as a discussion amongst our panel today. So uh, Kara begins our coverage today and she's been working with clients on their advocacy as well as understanding and interpreting what's been happening uh, politically for the last several months uh, and certainly for the last five years uh, in the, in, since the inception of the CFPB as well as also um, its activities since then. Um, but not since Dodd-Frank was considered in 2010 and passed in 2011 has there been potential for such transformative or evolutionary developments. What's going on specifically, Tara? Well, thanks a lot, Jonathan. And that's right. With this new Congress and the new administration, we can expect there to be um, an emphasis on, on a deregulatory environment. But what are we looking at when we say, you know, who's doing it, how are they doing it, and, and what can we expect here in the first few quarters uh, of this administration? So. Let's turn to Congress first. So looking at the high-level leadership, you can see the faces up here. A lot of things are familiar, not a lot of new faces. Arguably, you could say that Senator Schumer's a new face, but anyone who's been in D.C. Uh, would probably fight you on that one. Um, what that means here is that all of these players know each other pretty well. And if you were watching the inauguration coverage uh, like some of us were, you know, you may have seen uh, the, the cabinet signing ceremony uh, where President Trump was uh, signing the cabinet nominations and handing out the pens to the different members of Congress that are assembled around the table. It's a cozy relationship. These guys work with each other. So what you're going to see in this Congress is the typical style and speed of leadership that you have seen in the last administration, with the important exception that we're no longer in divided government, meaning the Republicans control the House, the Senate, and the presidency. So moving on to how things look uh, in Congress, when you look at the numbers here, you've got 
the Republicans maintaining control over both chambers, but there's a deeper story here that isn't quite covered. You know, the media and a lot of the, the pundits have been talking about this being a wave election, but when you see that Sen Senator or Secretary Clinton won the popular vote, and then at the House elections where Democrats actually picked up a couple seats from Republicans, what you're seeing is a deeply divided country. Usually that will mean a slight moderation in tone, and that's nowhere more importantly going to be visible there in the Senate. So, Senate maintains a Republican control, but with a th the thinnest majority. If you stay with me here, I'm going to get a little bit wonky, but under the current rules in the Senate, it takes 60 senators to agree to move a, a piece of legislation to a vote that only needs a simple majority. This is called the filibuster rules and cloture. So, essentially, eight Democratic senators, if Republicans can maintain um, party discipline are going to hold the key to any piece of legislation moving its way to the president's desk for signature. So what you see then is in the political landscape, eight Democrats basically being courted heavily by everyone on the left and the right to see if you can moderate a bill that is most likely going to be coming in its most conservative form from the House, mainly because the Republicans in the House don't need a single Democrat to pass a piece of legislation out of that chamber. What does that mean in, in the long term? Probably uh, a deliberative process and slight, something slightly more moderate. This is government at its best, uh, back and forth. Uh, some people say cutting deals, but I'd like to say moderating any, any kind of position so that it appeals to the widest network. If I was Senator Schumer right now, and I'm not, um, his goal is to try to create division within the Republican Party to try to peel off um, a couple of Republicans so that they don't have that party discipline and make that number 10 or 11 Democrats needed for every vote. That's just my inside the beltway view. Moving on to the other key congressional players, when we talk about financial services, these are the folks that are going to matter. And at the top level, again, same story, not a lot of new faces. You've got Waters and Hensterling, sort of the Tom and Jerry of the House here, uh, playing along with each other in the typical um, consumer-supported uh, role that Maxine Waters will hold versus the pro-business view of Hensterling. Hensterling maintains his control over that committee for another two years. And as long as he has the gavel, he's going to make it matter. And what's important here is you should see that Jeb Hensterling's new relationship with the administration is extremely cozy. You'll recall that he was up uh, on the short list for a potential Treasury Secretary. What you can view there is anything that Hensterling's talking about, there'd be very little daylight between his view and the administration's view. Um, <clears throat> so if he's got something in the hopper, you can assume that it's been indicted with the administration as well. Over on the Senate Banking Committee, um, the new leadership is Senator Mike Crapo. Now he's taking over for Senator Shelby who held the, the post for a little bit of the last administration, but Mr. Crapo was in charge of that um, committee before that. And we also have Senator Sherrod Brown, huge consumer advocate. So what we're going to see here is again a sort of um, battle of the titans as consumer issues are up against some business interests between Crapo and Brown. Um, now, they have a great working relationship, and I would say on the Senate Banking Committee, there is a sense of congeniality between the two sides, notwithstanding Senator Warren's ability to be a bit of a firebrand. But I think that's where you're going to see a lot of the, the, the debate on these issues as things move closer to becoming law. I think House Financial Services will maintain some discipline on the Republican side. You'll see up-down votes that are all Republicans versus all Democrats. But the Senate Banking Committee is where, um, where debate's going to happen. I've also included the tax folks here, and tax is going to become increasingly important to your financial services companies, especially as we think about comprehensive tax reform. Um, I think we're watching that not only for your enterprise risk issues, but also on, on issues that impact all of us, like the mortgage interest deduction or, or carried interest. I think that that's, there, there's going to be an interesting debate there. Moving on to President Trump's cabinet, uh, there's not much to share here that isn't already well covered. Uh, by my colleagues in the media and other uh, folks as you guys have watched this coming through. I will share a piece of information just hitting the wires is the Senate Banking Committee passed uh, Ben Carson out of committee this afternoon and he's moving towards a full vote in the Senate probably within the week. Um, and also if, you're of, if it's of interest to you, uh, Mr. Mnuchin responded in writing today to a number of questions posed by the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, it's 171 pages of his view on everything from the FSOC's ability to overturn CFPB regulations to um, where he thinks the mortgage interest deduction should, should end up. But let's go back to the President. Let's go to the White House. What is the rubric or the sort of um, overlay 
that we can expect from this administration when he's looking at financial services um, issues or anything generally. And I pulled this quote out from his uh, inauguration. We're going to start calling, I think inside the Beltway we started calling this uh, America First or Only America First. And this is the sort of protectionist and isolationist policy is going to trickle down into the way that he views um, economic initiatives inside his administration. So when you look at a potential issue or concern and you wonder what could Trump be thinking, these bullets, it. does it create jobs or bring them back on shore? Is it saving money for people who have jobs? Does it create ladders of opportunity for economic advancement? And does it reduce the cost of doing business? Carol, let's talk a little bit about um, what's expected. Sure. So we're starting to see these executive orders roll off. And I think in early in this administration, executive orders are going to be used as a way to uh, show action on those original campaign promises. So I've listed the first four here. There was a fifth that was just announced a couple of, about an hour and a half ago, uh, which is with respect to um, opening up the pipeline, the Trans-Canada pipeline to the United States. Um, interesting America first side note there. Um, he's insisting that the construction be entirely American workers and the steel used in the pipeline is all uh, American-made steel. Previously, it was going to be about 65% uh, American. Um, but here's what we're looking at. Uh, the Affordable Care Act and the federal government hiring freeze, withdrawal from the TPP and the Mexico City policy reinstatement. I'm going to focus for a second on the hiring freeze. So what that's doing is um, basically allowing the size of the government as it existed on January 22nd to remain static. So people who will retire or quit will be replaced, but no new employment. What that can mean for you, um, who may have frequent interaction with um, a federal government agency, is just a little bit more um, time waiting for a response as the personnel cost reduces uh, and the number of people available to answer your question reduces. But skipping ahead, let's think a little bit about where President Trump has been on financial services issues. So in the, or in the campaign, he didn't talk a great deal about financial services issues other than to say it was a rolled back Dodd-Frank. And what does that mean to him? And basically two things. It has to do with uh, too big to fail. So while he supports keeping the big banks, there's an open question mark about where he is on Glass-Steagall and the Volcker Rule. That's proprietary trading. Uh, by, by banks that have FDIC insurance. Um, Mr. Mnuchin talked a little bit about that in his hearing, where they don't want to probably eliminate something known as the vocal rule, but probably renegotiate it to, to find a way to, to help banks. Um, and then regulatory reform. How do we enable small business and moderate-sized businesses to access the capital they need? And just general regulatory reform. reform. The idea was um, for every regulation created, two have to be eliminated. I think in the first couple, if that policy becomes um, more formalized through an executive order or a presidential memorandum, I think the first year will be pretty easy. We can prob there's probably every agency has created a list of regulations that can go the way of the dodo bird. But as you get further into the administration, there will be much more difficult decisions to be made. So what's Congress going to do on financial services? Three things are worth highlighting. Um, Dodd-Frank reform, and I can, I'm going to dig into what that looks like in my next slide, but also in, encompassed within that, of course, the CFPB reform, as CFPB was also created under Dodd-Frank. Um, cybersecurity issues are top of mind for everyone right now, particularly in the sensitive um, financial services trade. And then um, I think releasing capital for small and moderate-sized business, that's our Jobs Act. And then we can never forget about the uh, GSEs. Uh, those things, that $5 trillion part of the economy uh, that, that controls 20% of our, our annual GDP. When we think about Dodd-Frank reform, there's two proposals, one's in the Senate, one's in the House, but there's a consensus view between the two of them. And some of us inside the Beltway say, call it the release the hostages. So these are the things that people agree on that we think can move somewhat quickly if the package stays small. And that is addressing this too big to fail issue and um, designating um, financial institutions, bank and non-bank institutions as um, uh, CIFIs or significant uh, uh, financial institutions. Uh, but more importantly and probably the, the easier lift is there's broad, broad bipartisan support for community bank relief. 
So that's uh, the proposals have to do with streamlining exams and simplifying the mortgage rules. Um, other people that are other topics that have people on both sides of the aisle in agreement are Federal Reserve, transparency, and of course um, loosening SEC rules so people can get out there and raise the money for shareholders. Uh, but let's dig into the, the, the piece of legislation that we think is going to be um, a vehicle or a tool for the administration and the House to demonstrate uh, their Dodd-Frank reforms. Uh, it's a piece of legislation known as the Financial Choice Act, and procedurally this was originally introduced in the last Congress. It's been um, under review by Chairman Hensling, and right now the GOP is on their retreat, and we expect a second draft to be coming out shortly. The second draft should look very similar to the first draft with significant changes to the way that Hensling is treating this off-ramp to FSOC SIFI designation um, and sort of maintaining a 10% capital threshold as an alternative to designation. Um, we think that that's going to be rewritten substantially, but here are some other ideas that I think will be retained. One is the repeal of the, Do uh, the Durbin Amendment. I think we're going to continue to see action around Operation Choke Point. Um, it's a particular focus for House Republicans as they think about things that they wish no longer existed. Um, and then significantly, uh, there will be a title in here to reform the CFPB. I've outlined here some of the ideas that are encapsulated in the last uh, the last version of it. Um, importantly, the replacing the single director with a five-person board and putting it under the appropriations process is an option, but it's also uh, an option that's being shared uh, with the OCC and FDIC and, and other uh, federal regulatory bodies, uh, including the FA, uh, Federal Housing Finance Agency. Um, the UDAP change, it would be interesting, uh, and I think it's probably important to note that the mission change, uh, making it a dual mission to uh, not only consumer protection but also competitive marketplace, it's a, it's a nod to the business interest, but it also is not unprecedented in federal practice insofar as that it sort of monitors some of the, the SEC's uh, mission, which is to uh, uh, facilitate the formation of capital. And Karen, there's also a lot of legislation of note that's been introduced, um, you know, specific bills to end Operation Choke Point. Uh, to address uh, credit union issues, FHA, uh, credit access, uh, debt collection, a whole host of things. Uh, with a now, uh, with a Congress and a President generally aligned on deregulation, there's a possibility for movement on some of these. Sure there are, and so I've pulled out some of these bills that have already been introduced uh, in the first three weeks or since January 3rd of this Congress. What's interesting about the top two uh, that we have on here is that they're Senate uh, or Senate and House uh, Republicans have sponsored these, which means that they'll probably find a vehicle. And in my parlance, what that means is um, another piece of legislation that's moving these will get attached to it. If not, something like the Financial Choice Act, maybe a tax bill or an appropriations brief. Um, but what you can look by just by this list is that consumer financial service or consumer laws are, are on the menu. Now, when you're looking farther down this list, these are bills that are primarily uh, sponsored by Democrats. These are positioning bills. I don't expect them to necessarily move to markup or even become law, but what they are is an important marker on that this is where Democrats are, are thinking about an issue and this is what they're rallying around. And then the, the President Trump's administration has a lot of power too, particularly when it comes to perhaps maybe not right now with respect to the CFPB, although that remains to be seen. Um, but with respect to Treasury and other agencies that affect consumer financial services, um, there's a lot of things that are either um, stopped or postponed for now, and then the ability to, uh, to kick out um, in short order uh, executive orders and other, other things that would impact the marketplace. That's right, Jonathan. So when we talk about what this deregulatory environment look like and what are the tools you, that can be used, it's not just legislation. So we have a couple of different options that the Trump administration can either do unilaterally or in combination with Congress. Um, so looking at some of the first ones, these midnight rules. Now we just saw a presidential memorandum come out on inauguration day that withdraws all the rules that are currently in the pipeline for publication at the Federal Register, sends those back to the agency. Um, and then it also delays the effective date for rules that were finalized that are anticipated to become effective in the new year. Of interest to the folks on this, car, on this call is probably the prepaid card rule. That's set to become effective in October of this year. Um, there's an option now as that rule is being sent back to the CFPB for evaluation to see if that, that deadline should be extended or if the rule needs to be reproposed and changed in some meaningful way. 
Another tool that they have is the Congressional Review Act. Some of you on the call um, may have uh, seen our, our presentation on this earlier this year. It's also available online. This is a sort of wonky law that's um, really only been successfully used in one transition of the administration, um, and it was to uh, prohibit the ability uh, for federal agencies to require ergonomic reviews. It, there's a particular appetite in this administration to, to look at those, this tool again, which will allow, starting right around now, for Congress to invalidate any rule that was finalized from about June 13th to present, um, or to Ju January 19th. They can invalidate that by a simple uh, vote in Congress. Now, there are only about half a dozen rules that are probably going to be considered under this, but we have, uh, as a resource available, a list of the rules that are potentially available. You'll see those CRA uh, or Congressional Review Act changes, if at all, come around in mid-February and last until May, uh, and then the, uh, the window closes on that, that particular tool. Um, moving forward, so appointments. There's 4,000 job openings available right now uh, in the U.S. government. It's going to take a while for the Trump administration to really be able to be, um, have its waves of appointments available to start implementing policy. So in some ways, some things will stay the same uh, at, your, at your typical agency. The telephones will still work over there to the guy that you probably need to, to talk to about a particular issue. But when you look at the head of these agencies, some people are staying, some people are going. Typically, regulators roll off in the administration, although some have um, already tendered their resignation. Um, importantly, uh, you'll see that the FTC, they have three vacancies, two Republicans and one Democrat. And then uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't share that uh, Director Cordray's term is set to expire July 18th, but uh, we're not, there's not a lot of chance of him being able to stay for a number of different reasons until that date. Um, Lastly, we can talk a little bit about exactly what uh, we think will happen legislatively, but uh, through the appropriations process and a couple of these other bills that are must-pass legislation, these turn into vehicles for, for financial reform. They, you know, they can, we call it a train or a Christmas tree approach where uh, financial reform or deregulatory pieces of legislation get attached to things. So what's the, the first opportunity? Maybe that debt ceiling legislation in, in early March. Uh, perhaps the government funding requirement uh, to keep the government open in April. Uh, so those are early, early opportunities for legislation that could impact your businesses to come through and come through in a massive piece of legislation. All right. Well, thank you very much. Now, all of this is happening with ongoing and, in some cases, long-standing litigation that has been pending against the CFPB about its constitutionality and its jurisdiction and general authority to do the work that it's been doing including a significant case that the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia ruled on last October uh, involving PHH, the private mortgage company. I'm now joined by Allison Baker, who's going to tell us a little bit about how the CFPB promises business as usual despite the PHH decision. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, good afternoon again. So as everybody on the phone probably knows, the PHH decision is a decision that grew out of um, an administrative matter that was pending in the CFPB's administrative forum. And the decision went up, um, <clears throat> the administrative law judge's decision went up to Richard Cordray for final agency action and review. In that decision, um, among other things, uh, Director Cordray uh, substantially multiplied the damages number that the ALJ had found and applied um, a view of RESPA, Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act guidance that was subsequently found by the D.C. Circuit to be retroactively applied. And so that decision from Director Cordray went up to the D.C. Circuit and a panel decision came down late last year or early fall of last year. And in a nutshell, that panel decision had three holdings. Um, the first was that um, the uh, CFPB was not constitutionally comprised because it has a single director who cannot be removed um, through discretionary act by the president, but rather can only be removed at will. Number two, that the CFPB, as to this PHH decision, uh, specifically Director Cordray, had incorrectly applied uh, RESPA guidance and had effectively, impermissibly, uh, retroactively applied a new um, understanding of RESPA to conduct that predated that, um, that stated understanding and that this was an impermissible retroactive application of the law, which essentially means, in a nutshell, um, under the case called Landgraf, that you cannot hold somebody accountable today 
um, for conduct that um, for for a, for conduct that was prohibited yesterday, and say when you broke the law, even though when you did it yesterday you didn't know that was the law. Um, in a nutshell, that's what Landgraf and, and retroactivity doctrine says, and at a very high level, that's what the D.C. Circuit held. And finally, the D.C. Circuit held that the director was wrong to argue that there was no statute of limitations that applies to the CFPB's um, CFPA actions, and specifically in this case, it's some of its UDAP and RESPA actions in the administrative forum. Um, the argument that had been um, made by the director that went up on appeal to the D.C. Circuit's panel was essentially that a case that was proceeding in the CFPB's administrative forum was not subject to any statute of limitations, notwithstanding language in Section 1054G of the CFP Act, which says that it's three years from date of discovery. Um, the, the D.C. Circuit held that, in fact, that three-year statute of limitations applies to causes of action that are brought in the administrative forum as well as district court, and that that is the case because there's a, there's a symmetry between um, causes of action that the CFPB pursues in the administrative forum and in district court for two reasons, really. One, the CFPB can pursue all of the same causes of action in either forum, and two, they can seek all of the same remedies for those causes of action in either forum, and that synchronicity was, was picked up on by the D.C. Circuit and argued um, the D.C. Circuit struck down the director's decision. Um, in response, the CFPB sought to have an en banc review, so the entire D.C. Circuit review the panel decision as to two of those three holdings, the constitutionality question and the uh, retroactive application of RESPA, which ultimately resulted in a substantially larger damages number um, than what the ALJ at the first level of review had initially recommended. Um, the CFPB did not seek to have an en banc review done of the statute of limitations decision, which essentially is a, arguably a way for the CFPB to concede that at the very least there's a three-year statute of limitations or a requisite statute of limitations for actions brought in its administrative forum. Now, th there's a, some important language in, in this PHH decision that I do want to kind of put in the sand as a marker. Um, first of all, the D.C. Circuit was very clear that notwithstanding its arguments about constitutionality of the director's role vis-a-vis uh, -vis discretion versus at-will removal, the agency itself would continue to exist and its operations would, would not be really affected or impacted by this decision. And I note that because a lot of the public conversation around this decision, um, and from, from my personal perspective, um, the, the impact of this decision is, is, more, is so substantial because of the public conversation around the, conver the decision, namely the idea that now the CFPB is susceptible to some kind of challenge because of this holding. Um, query as to whether the holding itself actually mechanically changes a lot of what the CFPB does. But what it does do is it opens up the door, arguably, for some to challenge the agency's actions on those grounds. And that is really, at the end of the day, kind of the big takeaway from this matter. Um, there have been numerous cases that have been brought in district court that have essentially challenged the CFPB using the PHH holding as to the statutory um, construction argument about constitutionality and the director as a predicate for arguing the agency's actions are impermissible. And Allison, even right now, there's pending here in D.C. a case by John Doe Company, uh, anonymously filed, yes. at least until the court rules on that aspect of their um, desire to be remain anonymous, on, the, on a petition to quash a civil investigative demand. So they're using PHH as a predicate to stall the investigation. That's right. Yeah, I mean, so, so that's right, Jonathan. There's a case that was recently filed about a week and a half ago um, where a company is seeking anonymous treatment by the federal district court here in D.C., uh, essentially arguing that the CFPB's um, uh, is not a constitutionally composed agency because of this PHH holding, and at the very least, this investigation should be held in abeyance pending en banc review of that um, panel decision. And, and so again, it's, it's an interesting um, case because it posits this uh, susceptibility of the CFPB at a time when, frankly, the agency, of course, is, is, is facing some political headwinds, to say the least, as well. And I think the general atmosphere has been um, some questions about 
how the CFPB ultimately shakes out. Um, but I will note this. Um, I have a pretty um, substantial number of investigations that I handle um, and litigation, and I haven't really seen any slowdown from the CFPB or any um, uh, contraction of, of um, enforcement activity, nor do I have reason to think that that's going to happen anytime soon. The CFPB still has a fairly sizable agenda that it needs to, means to accomplish. Um, student lending, in particular loan servicing, as we saw most recently in the Navient decision, but also um, other, other issues as well, mortgage servicing, um, small dollar lending, arbitration. Now, some of those are rulemakings, but some of those are also going to be in the form of enforcement actions. And just this morning, um, Rich Cordray was speaking to the Wall Street Journal and other journalists and made it very clear that the agency is going to continue to proceed apace notwithstanding some of these um, atmospherics that are going on in the background. So I certainly wouldn't encourage people or counsel people to uh, rip up a CID and assume it's not going to be enforced um, anytime soon. Yeah, it's been really fascinating the game out and every fact situation has been different. But with the investigations that we have that have been open or in some cases actually recently started, it's been business as usual. Absolutely. Uh, the, in fact, uh, the, the, to this morning's comments by Richard Cordray uh, at the press event um, were very clear. Um, he'll wait for a court to make a decision. Um, and other than that, um, you know, there is no slowdown. And there may even not even be a slowdown after that unless and until there's, there's new leadership at the Bureau or new structures, Kara pointed out. Well, let's hear from our panel. We've got a whole host of experts here who have been working in the trenches. Um, Andy, you were there for many years working on regulations. We're going to get to that in a moment. But if you're on the hook for one of these rulemakings, does any of this matter right now? Well, sure it matters. Um, you know, one of the things we'll talk about in a minute are the fate of these future rulemakings that are in the pipeline. Um, you know, there, there's a, the, the CFPB has a fairly aggressive regulatory agenda, which we'll get to in a few slides, that they publish in October. But you know, expectations in October were, were somewhat different. Conventional wisdom um, did not tell most people that, that we would be in this environment right now. Um, so there's a question of how much they'll be able to accomplish. Um, you know, if you're defending against an investigation, there may be less of an inclination to settle. Um, you know, there, there may be more of a willingness to, you know, to, to take the CFPB to court or to, or to fight an investigative demand rather than roll over. Um, you know, I, I think there's there's reason to do that, especially if there's, you know, potential change in leadership in the near term. You know, one of the things I'd point out to, to Allison's points about PHH, as you think about that decision and what it means on the retroactivity question, keep in mind that, that the real issue there was that HUD had published guidance that the CFPB contradicted. You know, that that's different from the CFPB taking a novel interpretation of something that's open-ended like UDAP. Um, you know, just because the, the D.C. Circuit ruled in favor of PHH in that case doesn't mean that any, anything that the CFPB does that's novel or, you know, isn't written clearly in a rule is going to be invalidated. Um, you know, so that's something, something else to consider. You know, I, I know that a lot of folks in the industry have read that as, a, as an open ticket, and, and I really don't believe that it is. Uh, Meredith, you're in the trenches litigating cases now before the Bureau. While you can't get into those details, um, how does this all change the calculus? You know, I, I would not change the calculus at the moment in, in respect to my own clients. I, I think that, you know, to the extent that there's some uncertainty as to where the agency is going to go, I believe that there's a lot of housekeeping going on uh, to get the, the files in order. And, you know, based on our own observations, it seems like there is a lot of loop closing and all sorts of activity that's directed at making sure that investigations are at a good place, that it would be very difficult to dismantle them um, down the line. And we're going to talk a little bit later as well about, you know, the role that these state attorney generals are playing in, in this type of enforcement arena. And I think that the pressure that these state agencies are putting on the CFPB and other federal agencies is um, continuing, it's helping the CFPB to keep its focus. I don't think that they want to be overshadowed by these state attorneys general, although I think that they, you know, value their, the camaraderie of them. Right. They may even be working more cooperatively with them in this perhaps transition period. Yes. So much more to talk about and keep an eye on, but we've got to shift to regulatory developments now. 
uh, they're potentially on the horizon, but perhaps not. Um, but look, there's another thread going forward um, uh, with all of these regulatory items, which is, is that to some extent some are in progress, some are not. Um, but Andy, you were there. Give us a sort of a capstone thought on, on regulation and with respect to the rulemakings that are active and then also some that have already happened. Sure. So, you know, if you look at this regulatory agenda, um, you know, one of the things that, that jumps right out, the prepaid accounts rule has been finalized. That was finalized shortly after this agenda was released. You know, remember, as I said a minute ago, this is from October. This is what the CFPB was planning to do, and it shows you what's the pre-rule, proposed rule, or final rule stage. Final rule stage means that there has been a proposal, the comment period is closed, and they're in the process of finalizing. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about deregulatory environments and rollback of rules. One of the things I'd point out, uh, you know, in, in many instances, especially where you have an underlying statute that isn't very clear, rules can be beneficial to the industry. So, you know, I, I think to the extent there's a belief out there that all, all of these rules will be rolled back, it's misguided. In many cases, they're helpful. If you look at some of the, some of the rules um, in, in this agenda, Truth in lending, um, you know, the, the TILA RESPA integrated disclosures, those are clarifications. Um, you know, there's even potential benefit, which Alex will talk about in, in a few minutes, to something like debt collection rules, although the rules are, are, are very complicated and, you know, there may be some negotiation about their scope or what they do. Um, but there's opportunity for safe harbors and clarifications, which I think are very beneficial. There's also some very aggressive groundbreaking rules in this pipeline, which Andrew is going to talk about, the arbitration rule and the payday lending rule in particular. You know, the fate of those rules really is unknown. Um, the CFPB had every intention of finalizing them. You know, really, the, in, in the instance of the arbitration rule, you know, it's been expected any day now. Um, payday still has a way to go on the policymaking side because it's just incredibly complicated. But both of those were scheduled to be completed this year, and they may be subject to some of the challenges that Kara talked about. So, so keep a watch on that. And I'll turn it over to Andrew Bigger to go over some of the substance. Great. Uh, thank you, Andy. And I think that your point is, is well taken. Uh, you look at the regulatory agenda, and you've got you know, rules that the Bureau has been thinking about but hasn't necessarily issued a proposed rule yet. You've got rules uh, where they've issued them and have taken comments and are working to finalize. And I think in each of those cases, you know, one of the open questions is how might things change uh, with the new administration uh, in 2017 um, in terms of how the Bureau, uh, as they come to finalize some of these rules, you know, do they take the same kind of positions that they might have taken um, if the rule had been finalized a year or so ago, do they maybe take a different uh, tack in terms of looking at some of the industry comments that have been submitted and maybe um, the rules might look a little different. So it will be interesting to see what happens when some of these, these pending rules finally um, get finalized, uh, if and when that, that happens. Just as a quick kind of reminder of some of the, the big ones that have been uh, in play, starting with arbitration, uh, this was a rule announced uh, in May, I think, of 2016. Um, basically, a, a proposed rule that would ban consumer uh, financial companies from using mandatory pre-dispute arbitration clauses with class action waivers in uh, contracts with uh, consumers. The rule uh, would eliminate agreements that block uh, consumer participation in class actions and would require the submission to the CFPB of uh, arbitration claims and awards. And uh, the rule had a you know, very broad scope would apply really across almost all kinds of consumer financial uh, service providers and industries. Um, another rule that uh, also was proposed in 2016 and closed a little bit more recently, the comment period uh, in September 2016, was a, a rule um, that would uh, regulate small dollar lenders and subject them to really very kind of strict, uh, detailed underwriting requirements with a real focus on ability to repay. Uh, the concern being that um, at least as expressed by the CFPB, is that a lot of small dollar lending programs, consumers that, that take them out can get caught in um, you know, a debt trap, especially where lenders are making loans where um, arguably the consumer couldn't afford them and the lender, according to the CFPB, maybe is able to make money simply by either rolling over the loans or through fees. Um, and the proposed rule, as I mentioned, the uh, comment period closed in September 2016 it would cover loans, uh, close and open end uh, for extending credit for personal, family, or household purposes. And it focused on kind of two types of loans, short-term loans of 45 days or less, 
or longer term loans uh, that have an APR over 36 uh, percent. Um, I'm going to flip to Alex in a second to talk about uh, debt collection, but just quickly to note um, another rule that the CFPB has talked a lot about and has been looking at for a while would be uh, overdraft rules for checking accounts. There has not been a proposed rule yet. Um, it's something that the Bureau has continued to, to look into. And I think that's you know, one of those situations where it will be interesting to see what happens moving forward with a, a rule that has been of interest to the Bureau but has not yet been uh, proposed. So with that, I'd like to turn it uh, over to Alex to talk about um, debt collection. So here at Venable, we've been watching the debt collection rulemaking very closely since the fall of 2013 when the ANPR was first announced. The current status uh, of the rulemaking is that it's still in, pre, in the pre-rule phase, which means that the Bureau staff uh, continues to prepare the proposed rules. So we, we're still not at a point uh, more than three years later where we even have um, a set of proposed rules. As you may recall, this past summer, an outline of uh, the proposed, uh, potential proposed rules was published uh, for consideration by the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act, or SABRIFA panel, uh, which convened in August. And that outline announced for the first time that the Bureau was bifurcating the rulemaking between third-party and first-party collections, with third-party collections going first. Um, but since then, it's been radio silence. Um, as, as we noted, uh, back in December, the CACB published its regulatory, you know, its semiannual regulatory agenda, which actually was prepared in October before the election. And in that um, agenda, it predicted that it would need through February um, of 2017 to get through its pre-roll activities. In other words, that the, the proposed rules would be ready sometime in February. Um, of course, the CFPB said the same thing a year ago, that the rules uh, would be ready, or proposed rules would be ready of February of 2016. So that, you know, those announcements are not very reliable, and then given the election are, are less reliable. Um, that said, um, you know, I think that going forward, we can expect that this rulemaking will proceed and will not get um, as much pushback as maybe some of the other pending rulemakings. And we can discuss you know, the, the whys, but for those um, that were disappointed by what they saw in the outline published um, in over the summer, including some of the very strict and somewhat surprising limitations on how collectors would be able to communicate with consumers, and what the so-called substantiation requirements potentially would look like, I think that there is a you know, way um, to get some real traction um, in the public comment period uh, that will unfold once the rules are published to potentially reduce the burden with kind of a new administration um, and different audience um, you know, reading those comments and, and participating in that, um, in, that, in that back and forth with industry. So you know, definitely, um, you know, think about you know, ways to participate in the public uh, comment period when that, when that unfolds. And Alex, that yeah. public comment period is likely to be both for third-party collectors and debt buyers, but also first-party creditors, which haven't been traditionally covered by the FDCPA, but certainly have been the subject of enforcement by the CFPB. That, that's right, but on a different track. And so while the third-party, you know, the current pre-roll activity appears to be limited to the third-party uh, collections rules uh, following the, you know, no, uh, the publication of the outline. There has not been an outline or anything similar on first-party collections, whether the Bureau is trying to you know, re-collapse the two back together and will issue one super proposed rule is unknown, but I, I tend to doubt it. Um, that said, they are committed to also uh, putting together proposed rules and ultimately final rules for first-party collectors as well. And, and, and by first-party, as Jonathan said, we mean creditors collecting their own debt. Yeah, and that's really it's interesting because this, this is one of those examples where there may be some folks who get 
a new regulation or perhaps over-regulation, and then some that, depending on what happens to the Bureau and, and the whole rulemaking process, don't get touched at all, except there had been this push on enforcement over the last several years in the, in the first party category. Um, but you know, one area that is not necessarily viewed at all as unfinished, but rather uh, very much active, uh, completed in terms of rulemakings, and then now um, being implemented by companies for over the last year, is in the mortgage area where the regs came directly from Dodd-Frank. CFPB had no choice but to push forward with mortgage regs from the start. Andy, you helped write those and supervise that process. Where are we at now? Well, it, you know, it, they're interesting times. I think in terms of CFPB engagement, you know, we'll talk about this in a minute, you know, the strategy moving forward is probably going to be to engage whatever leadership is there and seek relief. Um, there, there also is implementation, there's still imp implementation of the HUMDA rule, which is major, and TILA RESPA integrated disclosures, or TRID, was last year. That's still causing some hiccups. HUMDA is this year. You know, what is HUMDA? It's basically this reporting statute that makes you report loan data um, on something called the Loan Application Register. Currently, you have to report, you know, basic information about the borrower's, you know, race, ethnicity, and so on. Um, what the HUMDA changes that the CFPB finalized last year do is they expand the category of data to be reported extensively. So what normally would be your first lines of defense in a fair lending investigation, you know, the DTI, the AUS, the automated underwriting system that you use, the loan to value ratios and so on, that's all being reported now or going to be reported starting next year. So, you know, how does that affect your risk? You know, I think obviously it greatly enhances fair lending risk. Um, there's, there's a lot more transparency. Regulators and potentially private litigants and plaintiff's attorneys can see a lot about your loan pricing just by going into public records and use that as ammunition for a fair lending investigation or lawsuit. Um, you know, what I'm seeing a lot of is two things. One is a tech build in order to, to get the reporting right and not get in trouble with your regulator. Two is an increased focus on protecting yourselves against fair lending, um, basically against disparate impact or discriminatory practices by really vetting and scrubbing your data and running analytics. Um, you know, that's, that's an ongoing process. That's something to really look at on the horizon. One of the things to consider in terms of moving forward is the amount of data that will be publicly available or publicly viewable by those other than regulatory agencies is still uncertain. We probably, you know, there's a good chance we'll have more business-friendly leadership in the near term. This, that will be a good opportunity to engage the CFPB on that process and protect as much data from public consumption as you can. Um, moving quickly through the other regulations, I mentioned TRID, you know, that's still ongoing. There is an open proposal right now to, to, to make some changes and fixes. You know, it's, it, it was met with mixed reviews. In many instances, it was very helpful and clarified or, you know, expanded tolerance categories and others. You know, it, it, it may have increased difficulty. And one of the things that the, that the proposal that the CFPB put out did not do was expand regulatory cures. Again, that's something to really think about as you move forward and, you know, assuming that there is leadership change in the CFPB, to re-engage them on. They've been reluctant to expand regulatory cures. That leads to statutory damages risk. Um, and the more that they could be talked into expanding those cures, the better off industry would be. Um, there's also just the enforcement and litigation um, implications that Allison spoke, spoke about. One of the things I'll talk about very briefly is, you know, the PHH decision and what that means for RESPA. There's a renewed interest or sense of faith in the RESPA safe harbor for contracts, legitimate contracts for services. There was a great reluctance in the last couple of years to do marketing services agreements just for fear of a RESPA violation. There's a renewed interest in marketing services agreements because there's more assurances or more faith in the safe harbor now. Um, that's something to watch. And, you know, again, the, the theme here is any changes to the CFPB and structure and leadership will be new opportunities to engage. You know, think about an engagement strategy, not just to talk to new leadership, but also to talk to the existing staff who does all the heavy lifting. Um, there, there will be opportunities to expand cures, safe harbors, exemptions, and so on as we move forward, and it will be interesting to watch. And those are, those are areas, too, and those pointers are really appropriate for all of the rulemakings where the scales may be weighed differently in the future than they have been in the past, whether it's debt collection or arbitration even. 
where the CFPB has a vehicle, but there is new leadership, uh, the weighing of the scales, and particularly under the Choice Act, uh, yeah. could be significantly different in terms of outcome on some very specific items that are important to companies in the marketplace. Yep, especially if, if you're a potential larger participant, as, as the CFPB defines you, or if you're a small, a small bank or a small institution. Uh, you know, there, there are exemptions for, for those institutions that could be expanded. Yeah. So, you know, Andy, one thing you mentioned with mortgage, and it's uh, certainly not lost on anyone who's recently purchased a home or is working in this space, is the technology that's gone on into the mor in, in the mortgage area and the mm -hmm. investment that they've had to make because of all the different reforms and in many cases consumer information that's had to be deployed and how they interact with consumers. Now, that in and of itself, technology and consumer financial services has been front and center in the business community, not just in the regulatory community, uh, for many years now. And you know, while what we've talked about on the legal and regulatory front is going to be probably the most significant development for 2017, what happens to all of this. You've got also on the business front, uh, folks that have been moving forward for a while now and looking to D.C. and elsewhere for relief or a path forward for some of their innovation. Andrew Bigger, what's new on the FinTech side and what do you see as being the outlook going forward given some of the components that have been put in place over the last year or two? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to, to talk about some uh, recent kind of developments involving fintech. Although I would I would suggest that you know however you define your company, that certainly all the the CFPB rules that we've talked about and different enforcement actions are things that you're going to want to keep in mind um, moving forward. Um, you know, the CFPB, like a lot of other federal regulators, have been pretty active in looking into and considering you know what is fintech. How does it impact you know, financial services and consumers? Um, the Department of Treasury has issued uh, reports. You've had the SEC look at issues, the CFPB. The FTC has held FinTech forums. So it's a very popular topic right now. Um, on the CFPB side, there's actually a, a pending request for information on data access, which touches uh, the FinTech space. And comments are due February 21st uh, for those that are interested in. This particular request for information is really focused on, on access to data and um, you know, consumers that, that have uh, banking relationships or other financial services relationships where they have uh, account login information and other account information. Um, how is that information shared with other service providers um, that, that help consumers access different financial services and, and being able to, you know, for if you're a consumer, being able to go to one website and access information from a lot of different websites. And um, the CFPB is investigating that right now uh, from the kind of the consumer perspective, trying to understand, you know, whether any rules should be in place on this, you know, what are market participants doing. Uh, so that's something to keep an eye on. Um, also, a relatively recent uh, CFPB uh, development was a report on the CFPB's project Catalyst, which was released in October 2016. Um, for those of you uh, that don't know, uh, you know project C uh, Catalyst is a CFPB initiative to encourage consumer-friendly innovation, particularly kind of on the tech side. It's an opportunity for businesses that are very early in their business planning process to, to come in and meet with the CFPB, basically to get office hours. And this report um, highlights kind of what the CFPB's expectations would be for fintech companies. And it obviously comes very much from the consumer perspective. And I think in that respect, it lines up with uh, the Obama administration, uh, which on one of the last weeks or so that um, it was an office released uh, guidelines on how to promote responsible uh, fintech. Uh, how do you, you know, protect consumers while you know, looking at these issues of innovation and using new technology? Um, also, the, a lot of news about the Office of the Control of the Currency, which has uh, released uh, a white paper saying that it's willing to consider uh, applications for special purpose national bank charters from uh, fintech companies. Um, basically, a, a special purpose uh, bank charter um, can be given to a, an entity a, a bank that's engaging in core banking functions, including um, paying checks, which has been interpreted as you know, money transmission and, and other related activities, lending, um, things like that. So this is something that's gotten a lot of attention in the FinTech community. It's been pushed by a lot of um, participants in the industry as a way to help address issues of um, 
having to get licenses across all 50 states, how do you deal with state usury laws, um, and other issues like that. Uh, Andrew, uh, payments is also an area that's impacted, not just the companies that take payments, but also the companies that process payments. Um, you know, all consumer financial services comes one way or another, take inbound money uh, or move money on behalf of consumers. What's the outlook there? Yeah, so um, you know, I think Kara spoke in one of her earlier slides about you know, what, what's the future of Operation Choke Point, um, which was a, a DOJ initiative looking at uh, banks and payment processors and you know, the allegations of you know, the roles that they play in helping uh, fraudsters access consumer funds. And you know, really regardless what happens with uh, Operation Choke Point, the, the facts are that the, the CFPB and the Federal Trade Commission have been looking at uh, payment processors and others in the payments chain for many years um, with concerns about um, providing um, payment processing services to merchants that are engaged in deceptive and other unlawful conduct. And the CFPB has a number of cases that are pending um, on this kind of issue. Um, the FTC, for its part, um, recently uh, announced a, a matter, uh, a settlement along with the Department of Justice in FinCEN uh, regarding Western Union regarding use of the uh, money transmission service uh, by, uh, partly by uh, merchants engaged in fraud, and which is also kind of ties in with um, issues related to o Operation Choke Point and how the FTC and CFPB have been dealing with, with payment processors. So it's, it's an area where um, there may be some changes, but uh, you know, this is not something that is brand new in terms of looking at payment processors. It's been around for many years. I don't see it changing drastically. Uh, moving forward, as it's been a priority of the FTC and the CFPB. Yeah, it's interesting, Andrew. I mean, even this morning, uh, Richard Cordray said that in many cases, and he acknowledged not all, but a lot of their enforcement actions and uh, other actions that have been taken behind the scenes in the supervisory examination context have been unfair and deceptive situations, or in some cases, risen to the level of alleged fraud. Um, which, in some cases, with respect to uh, in, in other areas, has always been the case. So AML, for instance, AML screening um, in the consumer financial services space of transactions, that's always been an issue uh, that companies have to contend with. It's not it's political. Um, it's just a question. It's really sort of a fact analysis. That will continue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that's going to continue, and, and I think that the, the pressure that, that has been applied by you know, these various government agencies, not just to, to look to some of the kind of the statutory um, things like AML, but to understand how your payment services, for example, are being used by your customers and what the impact could be on consumers, that's something that's going to, going to remain in the forefront. Yeah, so this is a good time to transition to, to supervision and examinations an area that has uh, really taken off, particularly because of the CFPB in the non-bank space as well as also in the supervised bank space. Uh, Alex, what do you see as the potential changes for the supervision program, particularly at the CFPB, where it's been ongoing now for several years for many non-bank categories? Sure. So, so first in terms of what to expect to the extent that we can prognosticate at all given uh, the current environment under the new political and regulatory climate regarding process, I think potentially we will see um, from the CFPB a lighter touch uh, when it comes to the banks. And the CFPB uh, is required to coordinate its exams, including its findings and reports with the prudential regulators. Um, and so if um, there is a large, you know, schism or divide between the CFPB and the bank regulators, as some have predicted, and this potentially will play out, um, uh, in maybe not in a big way, but it will play out, it will trickle down to examinations of banks um, where they don't see eye to eye, for example. For non-banks, though, I think um, generally can expect business as usual um, unless there's, you know, huge cutbacks in, in staff. Uh, uh, you know, there's only so much um, exam work that can be done if they don't have the, the capacity to send auditors all over the country um, and do the intensive, you know, multi-month work that's required uh, to properly examine an, an entity. That's process. I think you know, in terms of substance, um, really the best way to kind of think about you know, 
to trends and developments and, and, and to prepare your organization if it's under supervision authority of the CFPB and other and other you know state and other regulators. Um, it's looked backwards and, and what we've seen and we'll cover these in the next few slides is um, increased UDAP um, kind of enforcement through exams and, and coordination with other regulators. So again, looking back these last couple of years working with companies um, that have been navigating exams and also you know, reviewing what the CFPB has publicly disseminated uh, on an anonymous basis about its exam findings. Increasingly we're seeing exam teams who we know are consulting and coordinating with enforcement staff looking for and finding UDAP violations um, during exams. You know, a slight departure from you know, earlier years and maybe some other um, supervision programs um, that are more you know, focused on conventional you know, check the box audits of, a, of an entity's policies and procedures and transactions against you know, the technical requirements or in some cases prohibitions um, of the relevant statutes and rules. And of course this is um, important, this is concerning for all the same reasons why um, reg, you know, regulated entities have been worried about uh, the CFPB's UDAP authority from day one. It's very broad, it's vague, and it's in terms of criteria pretty undefined. And you know, as, as many have, have you know, analogized it to, um, in some cases it feels like it's uh, CFPB saying, you know, you know it when you see it. And it's very hard, especially when you think about preparing for an exam and uh, those participating that have gone through that process unlike with an investigation, there's a lot of preparation that you can do. Um, you know, compliance management systems um, are activated for purposes of being always, you know, exam ready. It's very difficult um, to always predict or to always prepare for what would be a UDAP, you know, through the perspective um, of a regulator. Um, and with examiners especially who are, are not lawyers, um, they're coming at it um, with a different background, but again, they're, they are engaging in these UDAP analyses more and more. And of course, as this next slide shows, um, all of this is important because you know, the stakes are really high um, when your entity is under an examination. How they conclude um, can have really large repercussions, not just you know, monetarily and financially for organization, but examinations could lead to public enforcement actions. And here we just have a sampling of various enforcement actions across multiple industries, you know, different sizes and types of companies that we know uh, stem from an exam. And typically, this unfolds as follows. You know, the examiners make a finding, communi typically communicate that to the supervised entity, usually through what's referred to potential action and request for response or PAR notice gives the entity an opportunity to respond. If the examiners conclude that they've found evidence of quote unquote significant violations, again not the most precise standard, of federal consumer financial law, then the matters are referred to what's referred to as an you know, action review committee and that deliberates and considers all the evidence including what an entity's response uh, to the to the you know fi preliminary finding, and that committee determines whether a matter should be resolved through a confidential supervisory action or a public enforcement action. Um, there's no publicly available guidelines or criteria um, regarding how that decision is made, um, but you know we can assume that the same factors enforcement staff considers when deciding whether to bring an enforcement action is what's looked at. And you know, just for example, the severity of the consumer harm, how many consumers have been impacted, the footprint of the company, uh, whether the company self-reported or self-mitigated the issue, the state of the, of the entity's consumer uh, uh, CMS, um, compliance management system, whether the CFPB feels like uh, its CMS can, you know, is, is 
set up enough to prevent future violations or can um, you know, address the issue internally. And then of course uh, the policy and you know, PR priorities of the CFPB which are a factor. Um, there's also an appeals process that an entity can, that's uh, under supervision that's dissatisfied with either you know, a, a finding or a rating or um, you know, the way it's uh, a referral that can pursue. Um, we participated in them before. Um, there's very little public information about um, the, the various criteria that um, those on the appeal panel um, use to think about it. It's, very, it's not a very transparent process and the outcomes of them are not public. Um, but we have had some success and so there is you know, some ability um, to influence the outcome but in terms of you know, keeping it on the supervision confidential side of the wall, it's not, it's not entirely clear based on the enforcement actions that we've seen um, you know, what, what keeps, you know, what separates the two, and that's of course very concerning. And then finally, I think the most important thing um, to keep an eye on uh, with respect to supervision and what keeps us that work with clients during exams up at night is increased coordination and information sharing between the CFCB um, and state AGs or, or Attorney General and other state regulators. Um, given uh, the change in the regulatory environment that everyone anticipates and that uh, has already you know, been obvious, states, ex certain state attorneys general and other state regulators will be picking up the mantle. They've, they've said so. Um, and when you think about all of the data and information the CFPB has collected and will continue to collect through the supervision program, um, and they're sitting on all this information and they are permitted to share it and coordinate. Um, the rules, there are rules that limit the discretion of the CFPB and the way that information can be shared. They, but, they can, but they can and we know they do. Um, but they've also issued a proposed rule back in late summer seeking to change those rules to make it even easier uh, to share information with other regulators to you know, give them more discretion. And so, it's already happening. It potentially will ramp up for a number of reasons, including if this change goes through. Um, and so that's something just to keep an eye out um, for any for any organization that is subject is, is under an examination in, in the coming uh, years. And Alex, that's on top of already many examinations we've seen that are joint examinations with state regulators. Uh, if, you know, the Conference of State Bank Supervisors at the beginning of each year, and they probably just recently did it. Uh, or if they haven't, they will be doing it shortly. I'll have an annual meeting where they sit down with the CFPB staff and uh, hash out uh, what's going to be, uh, which companies are going to be under a joint exam and the schedule and how they're going to plan through that. Um, and all of that, that level of coordination, uh, presumably to one extent or another, uh, may continue going forward, particularly because actually, you know, some of the proposals or flo names floated for positions taking, uh, taking over the CFPB. Um, have been real champions of uh, putting the power back at the states um, and in some cases reducing the regulatory burden overall by deferring to state, right. state exams. So the state exam issue has always been one that's been vexing for clients because they don't know if the Bureau is going to be um, looking at exactly the same issues states have traditionally looked at, which they haven't, and vice versa. So I think everybody should keep a, an eye out for that. Um, also going forward, you have uh, just a number of practical issues in terms of the UDAP scale. Um, Andy, when you were in-house at, at the CFPB, um, not, not at a company, um, you know, was, how did UDAP get discussed internally when it was being bandied about? You did training for supervisors, uh, yeah, for so exam staff. You know, I, I, it's, a, it's a good point. Um, UDAP is relatively open-ended. It's more of an enforcement tool than, you know, something where an examiner goes through and checks the box for compliance. I, I think a good way to think about UDAP in terms of your exam prep is if they want to get you and they don't have anything else, that's what they're going to get you on. <laughs> and, I've certainly seen that. Yeah, we, we have seen that. And, you know, it's, 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 it's a fairly broad tool 
What I've seen with several clients, and not just with the CFPB, this also includes other federal regulators and state regulators, is that if, you know, if a company has a bad history or the examiners come in and the company looks unprepared or they don't look like they have much of a CMS, then they really want to find something. Um, you know, a good you know, prophylactic for that is an excellent first day presentation where you show, you show the regulators exactly what your CMS looks like, you have a PowerPoint presentation, you have the right people there, and you really look like you care about consumer protection. That's another thing to think of specifically with the CFPB and you know, with, with these more aggressive states as well. You, they, they're not necessarily just going to come in and make sure you're safe and sound. They also have a keen interest in making sure you're protecting consumers. But you can set the tone of the conversation for your exam, you know, A, by not generating consumer complaints, which is obvious, and B, by really having your act together when the examiners come in and impressing them. I, you know, the work that I did with the CFPB examiners, you know, I wouldn't say they're easily fooled, but I do think they're easily impressed. And, you know, they tended to, they tended to spend less time, you know, tilting at windmills and trying to find UDAP violations for companies that they thought were generally good citizens. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. Particularly now, if you have a compliance management system that's been in place for five years or longer, um, anything that had been a gap should it ostensibly have been worked out of the system at some point where you can now get to a point where you actually have a very uh, routine, stable relationship with, with the regulator. Yep. Um, and so to some extent, you maybe a swing of the pendulum naturally uh, irrespective of any of the political or policy changes that are made, just by the virtue of time. Um, there's been a lot of companies that have invested so much in their compliance management systems that to not get the benefit of it would be probably unfortunate. And, and, you know, one closing comment there, you know, just remember there's really nothing partisan about compliance. It, it's, it, it's basically there are laws and the laws aren't going to go away. You still have to comply with them. And, you know, being able to demonstrate that to a regulator is crucial when you're, when you're getting ready to undergo an exam. And, and more than anything, being able to demonstrate that you have policies and that you follow them, you have, you've already done your own testing. No doubt. So let's switch gears to enforcement. Um, that's been an issue since day one. It's also been the way that the CFPB has liked to define itself. But, you know, enforcement is not exclusive in the consumer financial services world to the CFPB. Certainly there's the prospect still for enforcement from the Federal Trade Commission, uh, particularly in areas uh, that historically have been nonpartisan, uh, hardcore fraud, and also consumer protection issues related to vulnerable classes of consumers. Certainly has been a, a key audience. Uh, for President Trump. And then also uh, state regulatory and attorneys general are very active and we've already seen you know, state AGs and state regulators essentially through this exam process and through the, the last five years um, step up their game when it comes to what's happening on the ground in investigations. But let me turn it off to, over to Meredith Boylan to give us a little bit of insight on the uptick that she's been seeing on the state AG front and enforcement generally. Thanks, Jonathan. Yes, we've been watching some really interesting trends with the AGs over the last several weeks and months. Um, in addition to the AG's own enforcement uh, actions, and of course they, the state AGs have you know, typically some sort of state UDAP authority, they have independent authority under Dodd-Frank to, to go after UDAP violations, and they also have a, a host of state regulations that affect consumers from debt collection to lending to, you know, all sorts of consumer-facing activities. One interesting trend that we've noticed just in the last several weeks, and I think that this is a direct reaction to um, the perception that some of the federal agencies are either going to be reorganized or perhaps get less consumer-friendly leadership, the state AGs have been taking a role where they're attempting to intervene into federal actions um, on behalf of consumers in their state. And so that's a very interesting turn of events. Um, whether they have any standing or authority to do so remains unknown at this point. Um, these actions are very recent, but we are certainly watching those, and it will be interesting to see how all of that plays out. One of the actions they, that the Attorney General, and it's, I believe, for um, it's looking at the map that's on the screen now. It's, it's the it's the blue states. It's the Democrats. The Democratic Attorney Generals have filed a. 
quite a few of them filed a motion yesterday to intervene in the PHH case. And so, um, and their, their rationale for, for moving to intervene was this concern that um, the CFPB is going to somehow, you know, go away or take less of an interest in um, maintaining its positions in that case. And they also have some independent authority and are subject to some coordination with the CFPB to enforce the UDAP provisions of the Dodd-Frank Act. That's correct. So, you know, it's, I think that the, the, the state AGs in particular, you know, there are some AGs who are, are really making a name for themselves, but, you know, Maura Healy comes to mind from Massachusetts, Lisa Madigan from Illinois. I think that we can expect to see um, a lot of activity on, on the enforcement side from them and also trying to, uh, you know, join forces, whether the federal agencies want their help or not, I think that they are going to try to join forces with them in a number of these pending cases and, um, you know, it's, it's a very, very interesting time. So as far as, you know, working with our clients, we're, of course, keeping them abreast of these developments and, and trying to read the tea leaves as, as to how things may, may go in the future. Yeah, Meredith, it's really interesting, too. I mean, if you go back and look at some of the issues that are brought by state AGs and investigations, it's oftentimes consumer complaint driven um, or some other tip of the iceberg that's not necessarily political or partisan uh, or policy driven. Uh, and then it just has a snowball effect where you might have a multi-state that starts off with a Democratic AG, but then eventually Republican AGs will join in. And before you know it, you have a, a multi-state investigation that could last many years and then, you know, add to the issues as they go, either because of the investigation or people's policy objectives, but they often start with issues on the ground. Right, and I think, you know, the, the, there's a number of headlines that I, I pulled that are recent actions that different state attorneys general have taken over the last month or two. And you can see that a lot of them involve lending, and I think that that's a pretty um, nonpartisan or bipartisan concern for you know all of these different agencies. And they're interested in the entire life cycle of the loan. They're interested from inception of, of the loan until you know through servicing, you know, the the, the, the pre-default servicing, and then of course with the debt collection, which is a really hot and has been hot topic. And I don't think that that's going away. Yeah, no question. Alex, um, you were working on multi-state investigations in addition to the examinations and supervision work that you discussed earlier. Are you observing any change in behavior uh, by state attorneys general? Um, no, I mean, with respect to the the, the day to day, um, you know, transactions and communications and, and coordination that a multi-state necessarily involves. It certainly has has been, um, you know, business as usual. Certainly, no no indication that the political atmosphere has affected what they consider to be the, their mission and their desire to complete their investigation. Um, you know, I think what we can expect, though, is that there will be, um, you know, more demands on um, on these staffers to you know to bring more cases. And that means to wrap up cases faster um, in order to make room on, on their desk for additional you know, work caseloads. And I think that's not a bad thing. I and mean, some of these matters, especially when you're coordinating with you know, 30, 40 uh, different state entities, um, can drag for, for many, many, many years. And that doesn't benefit anyone. So I think we'll expect to see kind of um, a light uh, being uh, uh, flame being lit under them to, to make these cases wrap up faster. Yeah, and then on the uh, federal side with the FTC and the CFPB, there's a, definitely a likelihood that enforcement to one extent or another on less big picture items, uh, less regulation through enforcement, but this purely enforcement for the low hanging fruit. Um, would continue to some extent. Um, but certainly if one goes back and looks at the uh, Bush administration and the FTC years there for eight years, there were enforcement actions that just wasn't necessarily earth-moving enforcement actions that would rewrite the law in a particular area like the CFPB has done um, consistently for the last five years. And certainly even the CFPB, it's a laundry list of actions it's taken uh, and investigations as well um, that have been um, smaller 
uh, cases that have not been um, changing of actual regulatory landscapes or uh, attempts to be precedential, but just enforcement of existing consumer protection laws. So, you know, how this all unfolds remains to be seen, but certainly there's a lot to think about. Let's shift now to our panel, and we've had some questions from folks. Uh, just a reminder, we've got about uh, five to eight minutes left, and we would welcome any questions from our listeners and audience today. We have one already, uh, which is very specific to PHH. Um, and the question has been, so what's, what's the impact of the timeline there with respect to uh, any of the political issues that the CFPB could be facing. And in short, it's really, it's uncertain. Um, it's just at this point, uh, there's a lot of different moving pieces and whether or not the courts take up um, PHH or, or make a decision, um, you know, all that's going to be in the future. What we do know now is, is um, what probably most people on this uh, webinar know already is that uh, President Trump spoke Spokesman Sean Spicer yesterday said there was no decisions reached yet with respect to Richard Cordray. And we've also heard from Richard Cordray and the CFPB that essentially through their actions and words, it's business as usual. So a combination of the two at some point may, um, may make changes, but also as Kara reported earlier, um, there's moves on the Hill on policy uh, and po possible changes to the law. We also, um, Andy, have seen a number of folks come to us on compliance and, and other issues lately um, that are uh, also for, for companies' business as usual. What are you seeing in the mortgage space as being issues that are front and center? Well, you know, again, I think there's, in the wake of PHH, there's a renewed interest in RESPA and what can be done legally under RESPA without raising the eye of a regulator. You know, what couple of things to consider there. PHH is on, on Bach Review. Um, there are still rest of questions that are out there. Um, there's also guidance that the CFPB issued that said, it basically said that there's, you know, marketing agreements and things like that um, can be done legally, but they're not really sure how. I think there's still a lot of ambiguity, but there's renewed interest. You know, there was a moratorium on marketing agreements for a while. It seems to have been lifted. Um, you know, I think there will be a lot of renewed interest in engaging the CFPB on TRID because of all the various assignee liability issues that arise from the disclosures. There's also, you know, the GSE starting to ramp up diligence on loans, which will cause more error recovery or, or discoveries, rather. Um, you know, there's, there's a number of things, that, and Humda and fair lending is, you know, really just kind of a cloud hanging over the industry right now. I think there's a lot of angst about fair lending exposure after the new reporting requirements take effect that everyone is really just trying to deal with. Right now, the, the emphasis is on, you know, as I mentioned earlier, getting ready to report, but also figuring out the impacts of the new reporting. Um, so that's, that's really kind of, you know, th those are a few things in mortgage. There's more, um, but, you know, it's, it will be an interesting few years. And I'll say just piggybacking off, Andy, what you were sharing on the regulatory front on mortgage and on the policy front, you're going to continue to watch like this, this um, sort of battle of wills between the GSEs and the FHA for control over the marketplace. As you think about the FHA premium cuts and what that might do to GSE market share, we saw that the, the premium cut was withheld indefinitely. Um, so I think a larger discussion will be, you know, what's the role of the government in the mortgage market as far as it, it's a government guarantor? Um, this is Allison. I, I wanted to weigh in a little bit more on enforcement of the CFPB, which tends to often be the 800-pound gorilla in the middle of the room when we talk about the agency because it's the most um, high, vi high visibility um, aspect of what the agency has done, especially with having a former state AG at its helm. And, you know, I do not think in the near term, and near term could be months or weeks or certainly I would argue months, um, you're going to see um, a receding of CFPB enforcement activity. If anything, I think you'll see a much more aggressive push to get big cases brought, um, as well as smaller cases. And, you know, Jonathan was talking about big cases versus smaller cases, and I agree that big cases tend to be more precedential, but smaller cases often have a deterrence effect that is substantial. Because if you're a small, a relatively small player in a marketplace or a smaller player in a marketplace and you see a, a fellow traveler become the subject of a big enforcement action or one that gets a lot of press, it, it certainly uh, concentrates the mind like few other things can. 
And so I don't expect that in the near term we're going to see um, CFPB enforcement activity declining. And to Meredith Boylan and Alex McGarris's point, um, I also think you're going to see a lot of um, tag teaming with state attorneys general. And uh, you know, I think that all of that is very important as we discuss and think about the way the consumer finance space gets regulated in the uh, new administration. I just want to echo, this is Kara Ward, I just want to echo what Allison was sharing. You know, fraud is fraud. Fraud is a bipartisan issue. And particularly as you look at the way that politics are lining up, um, you know, as an example, the Wells Fargo case, um, you know, there is bipartisan irritation on either side. So when you, you think that enforcement is the tool by which consumers are protected, I don't think Republicans and Democrats really um, differ uh, greatly on that particular issue. Regulatory um, costs. Probably. Yeah. And then shifting, we've talked a little bit about this, might shift the liability to disclosures as opposed to regulatory risk and, and supervisory risk. But look, fraud is fraud, and, and nobody wants to be on the side that says that, that we want uh, the consumer to be ripped off. Well, and earlier you had a, a timeline, Clyde Kara, on uh, federal policy and, and uh, Congress in the, sort of the next six months window. Um, that same pictograph could be used even for investigations and enforcement, where you've got a lot in the pipeline at the Bureau and at the Federal Trade Commission, whether it's in the exam setting or investigations, that to one extent or another, these things don't happen overnight. Um, so if they're there, it's whether or not people choose to act or what stage they're at. And clearly, uh, as recent weeks have shown, um, there's a lot of companies that uh, seem to be in the pipeline. Now, um, this brings us sort of toward the end of our discussion today. Um, we've got uh, one or two additional questions we'll work in, and then we'll wrap up. I know everybody's waiting for the CLE code. So uh, one question from folks, um, do you expect much staff change at the Bureau, not at the director level, but uh, in the different heads of different departments, and perhaps even at the staff level? Um, you know, um, this is Allison. I, I hear from time to time about um, folks at the Bureau who are possibly trying to leave or considering leaving, and I think you'll see some staff changes. Um, I think that some people will stay um, because it doesn't really matter what administration is in. I think others will probably leave either because of a change of administration, uh, possibly at some point a change in the uh, who, who runs the Bureau, and also because it's just a natural life cycle of how agencies work. Um, the CFPB is is um, more than five years old now, and a lot of the entrepreneurial kind of startup energy that fueled its beginning, um, you know, it's, it's an agency that's a full-grown agency now, or to use an analogy that's frequently used in this world, um, in the CFPB world, it's, it's no longer an infant or a toddler. It's probably moving into young childhood. And having said that, I think a lot of people might look elsewhere. I'm not sure I'd read the tea leaves to mean that they're all upset because of the administration or because that means there's going to be seismic changes um, but I just think that's a natural outgrowth of how DC works. Yeah, I'd add that there's been turnover at the Bureau. I mean, Allison and I both are alums, and you know, there there have been there there have been staff that have left and gone into private practice or gone to other agencies, and that's that's normal. You know, I, I think it really is tough to predict. You know what future events are going to occur, let alone how they're going to affect staff at this point. I think we'll just have to wait and see. And um, any closing thoughts, Alex? Um, well, I kind of always circle back to this, but um, you know, so long as you make proper investments in your compliance management system, a lot of this shouldn't shouldn't matter, and there's no reason to take your eyes off the ball now. Yeah, and there's also a lot of opportunity too for innovation, and uh, certainly the trend has been consistently um, throughout all of the regulatory community for consumer financial services that people have had their eye on the ball in terms of. Um, innovation and, and new products, services, and, and, and also being modernized. And I think that that's a direction that things are going to be going in and continue to go in, certainly in the future. So we're about out of, the t out of time, and we need to close out the discussion. So stand by for the CLE code. And as always, I want to thank my colleagues and also the great team here for putting everything together for us. For more information and to subscribe to our newsletters or to check out articles and publications, please check out our website at Venable.com.